Hi, this is Mario with Mario's Math Tutoring, coming to you with a very special video series, and we're going to be talking about 21 different concepts to help you boost your score on the ACT math section. So we're going to be going through 21 concepts. Some of these you might know really well. You can go ahead and skip uh, onto the ones that are more difficult to you. But we're going to go through them just one by one. Uh, these are ones that are, are commonly seen on the, the tests. Uh, it's something you want to familiarize yourself with. And you might want to try pausing the video, doing the problem first on your own, and then checking it to see uh, you know, how to solve it. We'll do it together uh, in this video. It's up to you. However you feel it's going to help you best, go ahead and approach it that way. Let's get right started into this uh, video uh, lesson, okay, talking about proportions. So proportions is an important concept to understand on the ACT, and basically what it is, it's just a ratio that's equal to a ratio. So together that forms a proportion. So let's take a look at these two examples. Go ahead and see if you can solve them on your own and then we'll go through them together. So the first one here, we're just saying, okay, what is the circumference of this circle? Okay, and they give us the arc length is 10 centimeters. So how would we do that? Well, we're gonna make a proportion. And the way we're gonna do this is we're gonna say, for every 90 degrees, okay, see 90 degrees, that's the part okay of the entire circle and if we compare that to the entire circle 360 degrees all the way around okay that ratio is going to be the same thing as this arc length 10 is to the entire circumference we'll just call that c so again all we're doing is we're just doing the part to the whole equals the part to the whole these two ratios are equal to each other. Together they form a proportion. And you can cross multiply across the equal signs. Uh, that's what uh, most students usually do. Uh, you can reduce this first if you want. I think I'll do that. So that's one over four equals 10 over C. And if I cross multiply, I get C equals 40. And that's just gonna be centimeters. Okay, so that's number one. Number two, this is just a, another common proportion type problem. And that's where you know, it's a sunny day and a shadow is being cast by a tree. You can easily measure the distance from the base of the tree to the, to the tip of the shadow here. Let's just say that's 20 units, 20 feet. And say you're about six feet tall and say that your shadow is about four feet in length. So these two triangles are similar to one another, which means that you could, the corresponding sides are proportional. So we're gonna make a proportion here and I'm just gonna do the same thing. I'm gonna say shadow to shadow. Okay, so the person's shadow to the tree shadow is the same as the person's height, okay, that ratio, to the overall height of the tree, h. And then all we're gonna do is we're just gonna cross multiply, so we have 4h equals 120, okay, so this diagonal multiplied together equals that diagonal. And then we're just gonna divide by four, and you can see that's gonna be 30 uh, feet, okay, that's the height of the tree. Okay, continuing on to lesson number two, in our ACT math series, we're gonna talk about averages. So here's the formula we're gonna be using over here to find the average. It's the total divided by the number, how many of the, the items that you have, that equals your average. So when you divide those two, you get the average. A common example would be like if you took uh, 10 tests over the course of your class and you add up all your points that you scored on the tests, you divide by the 10 tests, and that would give you your average test grade, you know, per test, right? Now, on the ACT, they don't always, you know, uh, give it to you in a straightforward fashion like that. They might ask you for uh, what's the total of all your test scores, or they might ask you for, um, you know, like how many tests did you take if your average is this and they give you this. So they may give you two or of the three parts and you have to find that missing component. It won't always just be straightforward with, you know, the total divided by the number and you just have to divide. So I'll show you in this example what I mean. And uh, you can try this on your own if you'd like. So this one, it says, if the total of your calorie intake over the past six days is 11,400 calories, how many calories would you need to consume today to have eaten an average of 2,000 calories per day? Okay, so do you understand the question? Basically, what we're trying to do is we're trying to get an average intake of 2,000 calories per day. So we know that's our average that we're looking for, 2,000. And we know that there are seven days in a week, okay, so for the total of the, for the seven days, so we're dividing by seven. But it looks like so far we've consumed 11,400 plus whatever we're gonna consume on that seventh day. We don't know what that is, so we're just gonna make it a variable. We're just gonna call it x. Okay, so now what we can do is 
we can solve this uh, equation, and we can do that by cross multiplying, or you could just multiply both sides by seven, okay, like that. So this equals 14,000, and then you have 11,400 plus x equals 14,000. Subtract the 11,400 from both sides, and that's gonna give you 2,600 calories that you need to consume on that seventh day to bring your average up to 2,000 calories per day. So definitely want to memorize the average uh, equation, average formula, and just keep in mind that it won't always be in a straightforward fashion, but just go ahead and write down the formula, start substituting in what you know, and then you can solve for what you don't know. I'll see you in the next lesson. Okay, the third concept we're going to talk about that's tested on the ACT is probability. So you want to understand how to work with these uh, basic probability uh, questions, and the formula that you want to know is this one right here. Probability equals the number of successes divided by the total possible outcomes. So a quick example would be like if you had a spinner, okay, like this, and just say it was divided into three sections, one, two, and three, okay, and you spin the spinner and you say what's the probability that you land on the number one? Well, there's one chance of success out of three possible outcomes, and you can see these are all evenly divided, so we have an equal chance of landing on each one of the three. So your probability is one third, one chance out of three. Okay, so that was kind of a very basic one. Let's take a look at a little bit more challenging one. And this one here says, in a four digit lottery, okay, one through 10, where digits can be repeated, what is the probability that you, prick, uh, that you uh, choose the correct number or pick the correct number? Well, one way to analyze this is that how many numbers are there? Well, okay, for the first number, there's basically one through 10. So you have 10 possibilities for the first digit. Since you can get that same digit again, there's 10 possibilities for the second, third, and fourth. And by multiplying those together, we know that there's 10,000 possible outcomes. Now there's only one correct one, so the probability of guessing the right one would be one chance okay, of success out of 10,000 possible outcomes. So your probability of getting the right answer okay, by just guessing one time would be uh, one out of 10,000. So again, probability, number of successes divided by the total possible outcomes. If you just take a note of how many there are total and how many that you want, those are the successes, and divide, you can calculate the probability. Okay, concept number four is multiplication counting principle. So what we're gonna talk about in this video is how to find the total possible outcomes using the multiplication counting principle. We'll take a look at an example, see if you can solve this one on your own, and then we'll go through it together. So for breakfast, you choose either eggs or cereal, and then you choose to drink coffee, tea, or milk, and then you choose a piece of fruit, either an apple, a pear, or a banana, how many different breakfasts are possible? So one way to solve this problem is to draw a tree diagram. And the way you can do that is just think of it as, you know, a fork in the road. You're making a decision. You're either gonna go with the eggs or you're gonna go with the cereal, right? And then if you decide to go with the eggs, you could pick coffee, tea, or milk. Okay, so we have three choices there, coffee, tea, milk. But if we went over here with the cereal, we still have a choice of coffee, tea, or milk. And then once we make uh, these decisions, we have three more. We can either have an apple, pear, or banana, right? So apple, pear, banana, apple, pear, banana, apple, pear, banana, apple, pear, banana, apple, pear, banana. So I'll just write those in real quick. So A, P, B, A, P, B, A, P, B, and A, P, B. Now if you Think of this as kind of like a choose your own adventure. If you go down this branch, then you can pick th three choices here and then three choices. So you could either end up going all the way down here, all the way down over here, but eventually you're gonna end up at one of the ends of these branches and you can see, you can count them up. There's three, six, nine, 12, 15, 18 possibilities. So there's 18 different breakfasts. But you can see that takes a long time to do that and on the ACT you're obviously pressed for time. So the easier way to do this is just to say, okay, I've got two choices for the main part of my meal, the eggs or the cereal, so that's two choices. And then I've got three choices for something to drink, so that's times three, and then we've got three choices for a piece of fruit, and if you multiply all these together, you can see two times three is six, times three is 18, and we get the exact same outcome. 
This is just more of a visual representation, but in the interest of time, you just multiply how many choices there are in each category, and that'll give you your total possible uh, different breakfasts in this case, or the different number of outcomes that you can have. Okay, moving right along, the next concept that's important to understand for the ACT is our functions, okay? So functions, in the normal uh, way that you learn them in your math class, look something like this, f of x equals, you know, in this case, 2x minus seven, and the way you solve this is whatever's in the parentheses, see the three here, that's your x value, that's your input, so you're putting that x in place of x on the right side of the equation, and you're simplifying, so here you would have two times three minus seven, which is negative one. So f of three equals negative one. So you have an input, and then you substitute on the right side and simplify. But on the ACT, they wanna test you that you understand the concept of how functions work with an input and an output, but they put it in a slightly different uh, form that sometimes students aren't used to seeing it in. And I'll just show you an example here. See if you can solve this one. If L square M equals M squared minus L squared, what does two, this is supposed to be a square, what does two square seven equal? Well, don't freak out when you see this symbol. You might think to yourself, we've never learned this uh, square, what does this represent, right? Just see if you can follow the pattern. You can see whatever here is in front of, or to the left of the square, that's gonna go in here for L on the right side, and you're gonna square it. Whatever's here to the right of the square, M, okay, is gonna go in here for m, and you're gonna square it, and then you're gonna subtract. So it's just following the pattern, realizing that there's an input, and then that, you know there's gonna be an output, you're gonna do a substitution and solve. So in this particular problem, if we just go ahead and solve it, it looks like two is our L value, so that's gonna be two squared. Seven is our M value, so that goes here, so that's seven squared, and so we have 49 minus four, which is 45, and we got it. So this is an easy one to get right on the ACT, uh, you just have to recognize the pattern. And if you're interested in learning more about all these concepts that we're talking about, these 21 concepts, I do have a course. Uh, you can check it out. I'll have a link. But we're going to continue on going through the 21 concepts. So uh, let's go to the next one. Okay, cruising right along, we're going to get into the next concept, which is circles. And there's usually one of these problems on the ACT. It's an easy one to get right if you know the equation of a circle. So this is what you want to memorize right here. X minus H, the quantity squared, plus Y minus K, the quantity squared, equals R squared. Now HK is the coordinate of the center of the circle, and R is the radius of the circle. So we're going to do an example, and I'll show you what I mean. You can see if you can do this one on your own uh, first, if you'd like, and then we'll go through it. So X minus 7 squared plus Y plus 3 squared equals 64. What is the center and the radius of this circle? Okay, do you have it? All right, so the center is at positive seven, negative three. Now notice how it's the opposite, okay? It's positive seven, negative three. It's the opposite of this sign. It looks like minus seven, but see how this is x minus h, so the h is just seven. And over here with y plus three, this is really like y minus a negative three. So if you can remember, it's just the opposite you know, sign. So that's the center of the circle. And then the radius, you have to realize that this is actually the radius squared here, 64. So by taking the square root, the radius equals eight. Now just to show you, if you wanted to graph this, you're gonna go right seven and down three. Okay, that's the center of the circle right there. And then you're gonna go you know, to the left eight units. You're gonna go to the right eight units. You're gonna go up eight units. You're gonna go down eight units. And then you can draw the circle through those you know, four key points. So definitely wanna know the equation of a circle. It's an easy one to get right on the ACT. Let's move right on to the next topic. Okay, if you watched this far, I'm sure you're picking up some excellent concepts that'll help you boost your score on the ACT. Just a quick tip, um, if you're studying and you're practicing to take the ACT, you obviously wanna take some of the previously released tests. I would go through those tests, you know, time yourself, 60 minutes, 60 questions for the math portion, and then you know, go through them and look at the ones that you've gotten wrong, try to figure out what you're not understanding, and then 
go ahead and after you iron out some of those difficulties, go ahead and take another practice test. But what we're going through here, these 21 concepts, these are ones that students uh, oftentimes make mistakes on and just a little uh, little twist, a little bit of uh, uh, understanding you know, how the problems change slightly can make a big difference in uh, solving those problems uh, more quickly and uh, of course uh, more accurately. So in this next video, we're gonna be talking about percentages and this is something that you're probably familiar with a little bit already, you know how to convert from a percent to a decimal just by moving that decimal point two places to the left, right? But on the ACT, what sometimes is helpful is to think about uh, how much more than 100% or how much less than 100% you know, you're working with. So for example, if you go to a store and uh, everything's 30% off, instead of focusing on the 30%, focus on the 70% that you're actually gonna pay for the item. So you could take uh, an item that's $40, multiply it by the 70% and then you know exactly what it is that you're gonna pay. Uh, instead of figuring out what you're saving and then subtracting it from the original amount, this is just allows you to do it in one step by focusing on 100% minus the 30%. Let's take a look at an example. See if you can do this one on your own and we'll go through it. Always eager to improve, you decide instead of swimming your usual 30 laps that you'll increase it by 10% today and then by 20% more than that amount, okay, that you swam today, tomorrow. How far will you swim tomorrow? So do you understand the question? It's basically saying that, you know, you normally swim 30 laps, you're gonna swim 10% uh, more today, tomorrow, you're gonna increase on your previous amount, okay, so uh, an additional 20%. So the big mistake that students often uh, make is they'll just say, well, this is 30%, I'll just, add these together, but that's not quite right. What you wanna do in this problem is you wanna look at it from this perspective. You're increasing your distance by 10%. That means you're swimming 110% of, okay, of means times, right, of your previous amount, the 30 laps, okay? Then you're taking this entire quantity, okay, and you're increasing by an additional 20%. So that means you're swimming 120%, okay, more, than this, okay, this whole quantity here. We're gonna convert the percent to a decimal, so this is 30 times 1.10, I'm just moving that decimal point two to the left, and then we're multiplying this whole quantity times 120%, which is 1.20. Now let's go to the calculator. If we do that, I just wanna show you something really quick. 1.1 times 1.2 is actually 1.32. So what that means is you're actually increasing you know, the amount that you're swimming by 32%. See, not 30%, it's actually 32%. And if we multiply by 132%, we're gonna do it all in one step. So we're gonna take 30 times 132%, which is 39.6, okay? So we're just gonna say 39.6 laps. Okay, so that's how you work with these percentage problems. Think about 100% plus or 100% minus and then take it from there. Okay, concept number eight that you wanna take another look at uh, when you're preparing for the ACT math section is factoring. So hopefully you remember all the different types of uh, factoring that there are. I'll just show you a couple in this uh, short segment, uh, but you might wanna go back and review uh, some more factoring. So one type here, is the difference of two squares. So a squared minus b squared, so a perfect square minus a perfect square, you factor like this, a plus b times a minus b. It's a sum and difference pattern. Another type where the leading coefficient is one, when you have a trinomial like this, you ask yourself what two numbers, okay, multiply to c, but those same two numbers have to add to this middle coefficient b. So those are just a couple of different types. We'll do a couple examples and then uh, we'll take it from there. So 9x squared minus 100. One thing that jumps out at me right away when I see this is that there's only two terms. So that means it's a binomial. And I notice that there's a minus sign in between, so it's a difference. And then the other thing that jumps out at me is, is that these are two perfect squares. 9x squared is really 3x times itself, right? And 100 is really a perfect square because 10 times 10. And all we have to do is make one of these plus, one of these minus, and we factored it. That's a difference of two squares pattern. This one here is a trinomial. I notice the leading coefficient is one, so I just have to ask myself, what two numbers multiply to negative 12, 
Okay, I'll just diagram that out. But at the same time, they have to add to this middle coefficient, which is negative one. It was negative x, but you can just think of that as a one, negative one. So that looks like it's gonna be negative four and positive three. So when we factor this, this is gonna be x minus four, x plus three. And you can check your work by distributing the x twice and distributing the negative four twice and then simplifying and you'll get back to the original. So this has just been a little reminder to you about factoring. Go ahead and review that a little bit more and uh, let's continue on to the next lesson. Okay, now we're gonna look at number nine, the rules of exponents. So on the ACT, uh, they wanna make sure that you understand the basic rules of exponents, but like all the problems on the ACT, there's usually a slight uh, twist that makes it just a little bit more challenging than what you learned in your math class. First, let's go over the rules of exponents, then we'll do an example problem. So first things first, when you multiply and you have the same base, what do you do to the exponents? You add them. When you divide and you have the same base, what do you do to the exponents? You subtract them, you take the numerator's power minus the denominator's power, and you keep the base as it is. When you have something raised to a negative exponent, that negative exponent doesn't make the number negative, it just tells you to take the reciprocal so you can write this as one over x to the positive n power. Anything to the zero power is one. And then this last one, when you have a fraction raised to a power, you can distribute that power to the numerator and the denominator. So this is x to the n divided by y to the n. So let's look at a, a possible problem that could be covered on the ACT. And uh, you can see it's in a slightly different format here. It's a little bit more complicated. And we wanna find m. So see if you can do this one and we'll go through it. So the first thing that I notice is we're multiplying all these together. And when we multiply, what do we do to the exponents? We add them. So this is gonna be x to the two plus three, which is five, plus m. So x to the five plus m over x to the seventh equals x squared. Now what do we do when we divide and we have the same base? We subtract the exponents. So we have x to the five plus m minus seven equals x squared. Now you can see that we have the same base, okay, so we can set these exponents equal to each other. Five minus seven is negative two plus m, that must equal two. So by adding two to both sides of this equation, you can see that m equals four, and that's our solution for m. So what made this a little bit more challenging is that we had to do multiple steps and um, we also had to set the powers equal to each other because we had the same base. So this is one possible uh, problem that they could give you on the ACT, but again, you wanna make sure you just review and understand these rules of exponents. Okay, our number 10 concept is Pythagorean triples. So you probably already know the Pythagorean theorem. A, B, and C, okay, when you have a right triangle, A and B are the two sides that make up that right angle. C is the hypotenuse, that's the longest side. And we know that A squared plus B squared equals c squared, or the sum of the legs squared equals the hypotenuse squared. But what you may not know or may not remember are these Pythagorean triples. And here's four of the ones that come up the most on the ACT, and they're the most common because they're the smallest uh, triples, but they're integers that form a right triangle, okay? So three, four, and five, if you take three squared plus four squared, that equals five squared. Five, 12, 13, eight, 15, 17, 7, 24, 25. So the number here on the end on the right, that's the hypotenuse, that's the longest side. But what you wanna uh, realize is that if you take any one of these Pythagorean triples and you multiply all the sides by the same number, that will also form a right triangle. So for example, if I multiply all these by two, six, eight, and 10, these also form a right triangle. So by recognizing these, you can save yourself time when you're doing these problems on the ACT. I'll show you what I mean in this example. See if you can solve this on your own. We've got a right triangle here, and they give us the two sides or the two legs, 15 and 36, but they ask us to find the hypotenuse x. Now you could go ahead and substitute into the Pythagorean theorem and solve for c, and that's perfectly fine. But what you might wanna do is you might wanna say, well, hmm, what can I divide both of these by? What's the greatest common factor? Well, it looks like I can divide a three out of both of these. Okay, they both have a three in common. So I could write this as five and this as 12. So then what jumps out at me is that this is a five, 12, 13 Pythagorean triple, which means that this must be 
the 13 side, but since I tripled these or multiplied these by three, I have to multiply the 13 by three, so that's 39. Now I went through and explained it, so it took a little bit longer, but you can do that uh, very quickly, okay, in your head or just by making a quick note like I did, did here. But what you wanna do is you wanna try to divide out that greatest common factor to reveal which one of the Pythagorean triples that you're working with. Now it's not always gonna be a Pythagorean triple, but oftentimes on the ACT they do use these common ones. So it's a time saver and uh, something that you might wanna review when you're preparing for the test. Okay, number 11, graphing lines and inequalities. So you probably learned a long time ago, right? The slope intercept form of a line, y equals mx plus b. The m is the slope, and the b is the y-intercept where the line crosses the y-axis. But one thing I wanna remind you of in this particular lesson is that when you're working with inequalities, you have to be careful because you know, you're gonna be shading one side of the plane. You know, you're gonna be shading you know, either above the line or below the line, or you know, one side to the other. And you can use the test point method uh, or you can use another method I'm gonna show you in this particular example. But uh, definitely knowing how to graph lines and inequalities is an important concept you wanna review. Let's just look at a simple example here. 3x minus 2y is greater than six. Now, there's a couple different ways to do this. One way is to rearrange the inequality and put it in the y equals mx plus b form. But I'm not gonna do it this way. I'm gonna do it a slightly different way. I'm just gonna set x to zero and solve for y by dividing by negative two. So that's negative three, right? So the y-intercept is negative three. And if I set y to zero, that means that x is two. So that's our x-intercept. Now you can see this is greater than but not equal to, so I'm gonna draw this as a dotted or a dashed line. It doesn't include the points on the line. Now what you don't wanna do is you don't wanna make the mistake of saying greater than, oh, I'm shading above. Because that only works when the y is by itself. If you have y by itself, like y is greater than something, 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 then you can shade straight above the line, the y values are gonna be greater than the y values that are on the line, okay, at that point, at that x value. But here what I would do is I would do a test point. I'd say, well, let me put in the origin here, zero, zero. If I put zero and zero in for x and y, I get zero is greater than six. Is that true? No, that's actually not true. So where this point is, I don't wanna shade on this side of the plane, I wanna shade on the other side. So I'm gonna shade, and that's gonna be uh, the solution set for this inequality, any point, in this region will make this inequality true. The other way you can approach this is you can rearrange this. You can say, all right, I'm gonna subtract three x from both sides, okay? I'm gonna divide everything by negative two to get the y by itself. But remember, when you multiply or divide both sides of an inequality by a negative number, what happens to the inequality sign? It flips, okay, it changes direction. So now you can see this makes sense, this is why we're shading below, okay, straight down below the line, because y is less than, okay. So a couple different ways to approach graphing inequalities, but again, you might want to review how to graph lines, the slope intercept form, graphing inequalities, and uh, this is something that's uh, tested on the ACT. Okay, number 12, we're gonna talk about equations of lines. So on the ACT, you definitely want to know the different forms of the equation of a line. And just to review, we've got the slope intercept form, y equals mx plus b. We have the point slope form. Okay, you can see y1, x1 is the point, m is the slope. And we have the standard form, ax plus by equals c. So we're just gonna go through a typical example here and uh, see if you can do it on your own if you'd like first and then we'll go through it together. We're gonna take a look at these two lines here and we're gonna ask ourselves, are they parallel, perpendicular, or neither? Okay, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna analyze these two lines. This one is in the slope intercept form because the y is by itself here already. So that tells us that the slope of this line is two thirds. Okay, so that's the M right here. This one here though, we need to rearrange it. We need to put it into the slope intercept form. And we're gonna do that by subtracting three X. So that's two Y equals negative three X plus six. We're gonna divide everything by two. And so we get Y equals negative three halves X plus three. Okay, now we're gonna analyze this. This line has a slope of two thirds. This line has a slope of negative three halves. When the slopes are opposite reciprocals of each other, meaning they're the opposite sign, one's positive, one's negative, and you take the fraction, you flip it over, that means it's the reciprocal of, of one another. If they're both opposite signs and reciprocals of each other, then it means that the lines are perpendicular. If they have the same slope, then the lines are parallel, and if it's neither, 
then of course it's neither. So this is a typical problem that's covered on the ACT, but just knowing how to rearrange the equations into the slope intercept form will help you to identify the, the m value of the slope, and then you can compare the lines to see if they're parallel, perpendicular, or neither. Okay, number 13 is the slope. So you want to refresh or just remind yourself of what the slope is. It's the rise over the run. It's the you know change in y over the change in x. It gives you the angle of the line, right? Or if you have two points, you can subtract the two y coordinates and then subtract the two x coordinates and divide. But you want to make sure that you're consistent with that. You either want to do y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1 or vice versa, y1 minus y2 divided by x1 minus x2. We'll look at an example here. What's the slope through the points negative 6, 2, and 4, 8? Okay, so if we want to just label this here, you can see this is x1, y1, and x2, y2. So we're going to do y2 minus y1, 8 minus 2, over x2 minus x1, 4 minus a negative 6. So when you subtract, it's like adding the opposite. So that gives us 10. 8 minus 2 is 6, and we can reduce this to 3 fifths. That's the slope of our line. So again, slope's an important concept you want to know for the ACT. Just uh, refresh on the formula, and I think you'll have it. Okay, another important concept to understand for the math portion of the ACT is the midpoint. So you probably learned this formula before in your math class. If not, just uh, it's easy to understand. What you're doing is you're averaging the x's and you're averaging the y's. So you're just adding the x coordinates together and dividing by 2, adding the y coordinates together divided by 2, and that'll give you the midpoint between two given points. Okay, so the halfway point. Now on the ACT, they have a way of, you know, just slightly putting a little twist on the problem so that you have to recognize, oh, they're asking me for the midpoint. You know, they're not necessarily going to come out and say, you know, find the midpoint. So let's see if we can do this example. And uh, you can do it on your own if you like, and we can go through it, or we can just go through it here. The airport is 7 miles west and 12 miles north of your home. Halfway between your house and the airport is a waterfall. Okay, How many miles west and north of your house is the waterfall, the waterfall located? Okay, What you might want to do in a problem like this is just draw a diagram. So if we go over here and we just draw this on a coordinate axis, let's just say that your home is right at the origin Okay, for convenience, and the airport is located seven miles west, okay, so never eat sour watermelon, right, the northeast, southwest, okay, so it's seven miles west, okay, so seven to the west, and 12 to the north of your house, okay, so that means this point right here where the airport is, this is negative seven, positive 12. You're going left seven, okay, and you're going up 12, so we're just making this negative because you're going to the left, and the 12 is positive because you're going up, so what we've done is we've effectively uh, coordinatized these locations. But what we're trying to do is the waterfall is located halfway between your house and the airport, somewhere right about there. So we're going to use the midpoint formula. We're going to add the two x coordinates, negative 7 plus 0, divided by 2. And we're going to add the two y coordinates, 12 plus 0, okay, divided by 2. So if we do that, we get negative 3.5 comma 6. So it's three and a half blocks west of your house. I'm sorry, three and a half miles west of your house and six miles north. So midpoint is definitely an important a formula that you want to know for the ACT, something that's covered. But again, it won't necessarily just come out and say, you know, find the midpoint. You may have to coordinateize the points like I did here and then you know, go ahead and find the midpoint and then interpret the solution from there. Okay, number 15, cruising right along. We're going to talk about logs now. So logs is just something that's just barely touched on uh, in the ACT. Uh, usually there's maybe just one problem. And the main thing is knowing how to switch from, you know, the logarithmic form to the exponential form, which we're more familiar with. And an easy way to think about this is just uh, to switch forms is to do the inverse or the opposite. So what you could do is you could exponentiate okay, both sides using the same base. So exponential functions, logarithmic functions, they're inverses of each other. They cancel one another out. And then x just equals b to the n. So we're going to do an example. But before I do that, I just want to mention that every one of these 21 concepts 
could potentially raise your score by one additional point. So even if you get a handful of ideas out of this uh, course, this mini course here, um, you, know, you can boost your score by you know a number of points and it can make quite a bit, bit of difference in your overall score. I do have an ACT uh, math booster score uh, course that's for sale. If you're interested in checking that out, I'll have a link for that. You can also check uh, my channel homepage. I have a link there as well. And uh, we're going to continue on going through these 21 concepts. This is just an introduction. I go a little bit more in depth in the course. I give you some worksheets and some uh, more teaching and some more examples. And so you'll get a little bit more out of that course. But uh, what I have here is just a sampling of all the different topics. To you'll, you'll get a lot of benefit from this as well. But if you want to go deeper with it, uh, I encourage you to check that out. But let's go ahead and solve this problem and continue on with the, with the 21 concepts. So here, we've got log base x of 25 equals 2. We want to solve okay, for the base here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to exponentiate. Okay, I'm going to raise both sides using the base x because exponential functions and logarithmic functions, they're inverse, they cancel one another. And so now you can see x squared equals 25. So that means that x must be 5. Okay, so that's it. So we solve it. So just knowing the basics about how to work with logs uh, is an easy uh, way to score an additional point on your test. Let's go on to the next topic. Okay, number 16, we're gonna be talking about distance. So distance is something important to know for the ACT, and the formula for finding the distance is over here. X2 minus X1 squared plus Y2 minus Y1 squared. You add those two quantities together, you take the square root, and that'll give you the distance between two points. So on the ACT, like most of their problems, they're not necessarily straightforward like you learned them in your math class. They put a little twist on it, and that's the case here. So in this story problem, uh, let's see what they give us. Your hair salon is two miles east of your home and four miles north. Your dance studio is five miles west of your home and 20 miles south. How far is it in a straight line from your salon to your studio? Okay, good question. So what we want to do is we want to draw a sketch, kind of like we did in the midpoint lesson, and coordinateize our points. So here we're thinking of north, east, south, and west. And let's see, your hair salon is two miles east, so we're going two to the east and four miles north. So that's like right about here. So that's two comma four, two to the east, four to the north. And then your dance studio is five miles west, so we're going five miles this way and 20 miles south. So down here, so that's negative five, negative 20. Now I'm using the negatives because we're going left, that's negative, and down, that's negative. And we wanna find this distance between the two. So we're gonna use our distance formula. So we're gonna take two minus negative five, two minus negative five squared, plus four minus negative 20, okay, squared. Add those together and take the square root. So this is gonna be seven squared plus 24 squared. Take the square root, this is 49 plus, uh, let's see, 576, which is 625, which equals 25. So it would be 25 miles in a straight line distance from here to here. So I hope that helped you understand the distance formula a little bit better, but just a couple of hints here about coordinatizing the points and then using the distance formula once you have them as coordinates. And uh, let's continue on to the next lesson. Okay, number 17, we're gonna talk about trigonometry. So you probably remember this acronym from your geometry or your algebra two class, the SOCA-TOA. And all this means is that the sine of an angle is the ratio of the opposite side over the hypotenuse, the cosine of an angle is the adjacent side over the hypotenuse, and the tangent is the ratio of the opposite side over the adjacent. So if this is your angle theta, opposite is across, adjacent is next to, and the hypotenuse is across from the right angle. So let's, I'll show you a typical example and uh, we'll go through it. Say you wanna solve for this missing side right here, x. So they give us the angle, they give us a side adjacent to the angle, and they give us a side across from the right angle, the hypotenuse. That's what we wanna solve for actually, is, is the hypotenuse. So here we're gonna use the cosine, because cosine okay, of 15 degrees equals the adjacent side, eight, over the hypotenuse, x. Now just a quick note, Sometimes on the ACT, they might not actually have a numerical value. They might just say, hmm, 
let's just leave that leave it in calculator ready form and one thing to note is that when you have a ratio equals a ratio like this you can switch these quantities here on the diagonal so I could write this as x over 1 which is just x equals 8 divided by the cosine of 15 so this could be one of your multiple choice answers it might not actually give you the exact you know decimal approximation they might just say 8 cosine 15 they might even take it a step further and the reciprocal of cosine okay one of our cosine is secant the answer may even be 8 secant of 15 degrees so this lesson has just been to remind you a little bit about how to work with the sine cosine and tangent and just knowing this acronym and knowing the ratios and then also just kind of giving you a heads up about you know the format of the answer it might be just in a calculator ready form okay number 18 special right triangles so this is definitely something important you want to know for the math section of the ACT the two you want to know are the 30 60 90 and the 45 45 90 so if you can remember these ratios the side across from the 30 degree angle that's the X side the one across from the 60 that's the X square root 3 side and the one across from the 90 that's the 2x side with the 45 45 90 this is an isosceles triangle both these legs are the same length but the hypotenuse is the leg times square root of 2. So just a quick uh, review, if they give you the leg, you multiply by the square root of 2 to get the hypotenuse. If they give you the hypotenuse, you divide by the square root of 2. And over here, if they give you the shortest leg, you double it to get the hypotenuse, multiply by the square root of 3 to get the longer leg. If they give you the hypotenuse, you divide by 2 to get the shorter leg, and then multiply by the square root of 3 to get the longer leg. If they give you the longer leg, you divide by the square root of 3 to get the shorter leg, and then double to get the hypotenuse. So that's a quick overview of the 30, 60, 90, 45, 45, 90. Let's look at a couple examples here. So this one we're solving for y, and I can see it's a 30, 60, 90 triangle. This is the x square root of 3 side here. So to get to this side, I have to divide by the square root of 3. Okay. Now to get from the shorter leg to the hypotenuse, I have to double that. So this is going to be 12 divided by the square root of 3. But you don't want that squared in the denominator, so we're going to rationalize it. So that's 12 squared of 3 over 3. The 12 and the 3 reduce, so this is just going to be 4 squared of 3. This one, you see how these two sides are the same, and this is a right triangle? That tells us that this is a 45, 45, 90 triangle. They're giving us the hypotenuse 10, so we have to divide by the square root of 2 to get back to the leg. So if we rationalize again for this one, we get 10 square root of 2 over 2. The 10 and the 2 reduce, and we just get 5 square root of 2. So try and uh, remember and memorize and, and review these uh, special right triangles if you need to. Uh, these are two uh, that are covered on the test. Knowing this can uh, definitely improve your score by a couple of points. It might just be used in the context of a problem, uh, not just a problem on its own, but just like as a part of a problem. But uh, knowing this will, will save you some time. Okay, number 19, we're going to talk about perimeter, area, and volume. And this is just a reminder that, you know, it's important to know these concepts on the uh, ACT, uh, knowing perimeter, area, and volume. So we'll just go over the formulas real quick here. And that's um, for a circle, you want to know the circumference, 2 pi r, or pi times diameter, and the area equals pi r squared. A trapezoid, you add the two bases, these are the parallel sides, times the height, that's the perpendicular distance, times 1 half, that's the area. For a triangle, you do the base times the height times one half. For the volume of a pyramid, you do one third the area of the base, whatever shape this is, you find the area, if it's a square or a triangle or a hexagon, times the height. Okay. For a cylinder, the volume equals the area of the base pi r squared times the height. The surface area equals 2 pi r squared, that's the two circles, plus 2 pi r h, that's the lateral area or the sides. In a cone, the volume equals one-third pi r squared times the height. And I'll just maybe mention one quick example that comes up on the ACT, and that's that sometimes they'll ask you for the perimeter of something that looks like this. And there's a little trick to it, and that's that they'll give you some of these dimensions. But what you can do is you can think of these pieces as being uh, separated or disconnected. And what you can do is you can actually move them like this. Okay, and take this piece over here, move it over. And what you can actually do is you can actually make this into a rectangle, which makes it a lot easier to find the perimeter. You just add up all 
the sides, and that's the perimeter. Instead of just adding each of these individual ones, you can think of the segments as being disconnected, and you can make it into a more convenient shape or rectangle. A problem like this oftentimes comes up in the practice tests on the ACT, so that might be something you might want to uh, think about. And then also just review these formulas so that you're, uh, you're prepared. Okay, number 20. We're going to talk about parallel lines and angles. So you probably remember this from your geometry class, or your algebra class, where you have two parallel lines, and that's what these little arrows indicate is that they're parallel, cut by a third line called the transversal. And there's eight angles that are formed. What you want to know are which angles are congruent, which angles are supplementary. Now, the ones that are across from each other, like one and four, two and three, five, eight, and six and seven, those are called vertical angles, and those are congruent. The other angles are called corresponding angles. If you take these four angles here and you place them on top of these, see how this forms an X? If you place that X on top of that X, the angles that match up, those are called corresponding angles, and those angles will be congruent to each other. The other two that we want to pay attention to are the alternate interior angles. That's like three and six, four and five. Interior means they're in between. Alternate means one's on the left, one's on the right. So these are alternate interior, and those are congruent. And then one and eight, two and seven, those are alternate exterior angles, and those are also congruent. And uh, the other angles, like for example, two and four, see how they form a straight line? That's called a linear pair. Those are supplementary or like four and six, or three and five, those are supplementary. Those are what are called uh, consecutive interior angles. So you might just want to review this particular diagram, parallel lines cut by a transversal, in preparation for the ACT. But we'll take a look at an example here, and I'll just show you how to approach it. You can see these two lines are parallel, and these two lines are parallel. And sometimes what helps is to extend the lines a little bit, just so you can see that diagram over there uh, jump out at you a little bit more in the, this diagram here. So you can see that these two angles are alternate interior angles. So if this is 30, this is 30. Also, you know in a triangle, all the angles add up to 180, which means that this angle must be 30 as well, as it adds up to 180. And then if you look at it from, kind of rotate this, these two angles here are alternate interior angles. That means that this is 30. These add up to 60, which means that this angle is 120. These form a linear pair, so that means that x equals 60. So you can work your way through the diagram like that using alternate interior angles, vertical angles, linear pairs, and so on. But this is just a reminder to review uh, this diagram here and all the different types of angles, uh, whether they're uh, congruent or complementary, supplementary, that sort of thing. Okay, we've reached the 21st concept on ACT Math, Boost Your Score. And I hope you've been enjoying this and I hope uh, I hope this is going to help you increase your score on the ACT. So subscribe to the channel. I encourage you to do that. If you want to learn more and you want to get more uh, practice and see more examples and more of my teaching uh, specifically about the ACT, I do have a course. I'll have a link for that where you can uh, check it out on my uh, channel header page. But let's get into this last example, and that's uh, talking about how to, how to solve inequalities. Um, when you solve inequalities, it's just like solving an equation. You want to get the variable on one side and the number on the other. But the one thing that uh, sometimes students get a little bit confused on is uh, what happens when you multiply or divide by a negative number. And what happens is that the inequality sign will change direction, but it's only if you're multiplying or dividing. It doesn't affect it if you're adding or subtracting negative numbers, just multiplying and dividing. So I'll show you in this example how I would approach this. I'm going to add the 3x over here to the other side. Okay just to get the variables on one side and the numbers on the other. So that gives us 6x and negative 18. Then what I'm going to do is I'm going to divide by 6, okay, and that's going to be negative 3. Now notice I didn't change the sign. This number is negative, but I didn't divide by a negative number. So only if you divide or multiply by a negative number does that sign change. But what I am going to do for my final result is I'm going to take this inequality, I'm going to flip it over because I want the variable to be on the left. So this is going to be x is less than negative 3. You can see it's still pointing to the x like it was in the uh, step before. Okay, but now I've got the variable on the left. So I took that whole thing and I flipped it over so that now we can see what x is. x is less than negative 3, and we've got it. But just remember when you're solving these, multiply or divide by a negative number, the inequality sign flips. I want to wish you the best of luck on the ACT.